Hey folks, welcome back. Let's continue our legwork for the AK Gopalan case before wading into the actual judgment given by the Supreme Court. The conundrum we are looking at in this video is between uh, due process of the law and procedure established by the law. These two legal phrases form the crux of the uh, AK Gopalan judgment. This, these are the phrases that the court looked at before giving its verdict. The second phrase, procedure established by the law, is a narrower one as compared to the first one, due process of the law. Procedure established by the law implies that the courts will only check whether the action carried out by the state authorities was as per the law. Okay, For example, uh, if a person is arrested uh, by the local police and then that person approaches the courts for redressal, the courts will only check whether the arrest was made as per any law in force on that person at that time. That is all that the courts are allowed to check. Right? For example, there are... Um, so, in India, for example, as you might be aware, you're not supposed to arrest a female after sunset. So, that is given in the Criminal Procedure Code. So if a person, if a, a woman is arrested after sunset, let's say at midnight or something like that, then the court can definitely uh, order her release because the procedure established by the law was not uh, adhered to. The due process of the law phrase, on the other hand, gives a much wider scope for the courts. The courts basically get uh, plenty of opportunity for judicial review in jurisdictions where due process of the law is applicable. What this means is that uh, if a person, let's say, continuing our example, is arrested or detained, not only will the courts ensure that the arrest or detention was as per the procedure, but also check whether that law was passed by a competent legislature, whether that law overall conforms to the constitution and the laws of the land, and also whether the uh, law adheres to the tenets of natural justice. So it is basically almost a carte blanche given to the courts um, and in certain cases the courts have ended up becoming kind of a super legislature over and above the um, over and above the legislature that had passed that particular law. The due process of the law phrase comes to us from the Magna Carta. It is inevitable that uh, in any discussions related to constitutions and constitutional courts, the original law of democracies has to show up. And here we are. The Magna Carta initially signed in the year 1215 of the Common Era. And the phrase that we are interested in, due process of law, appears for the first time in the 1354 rendition, the statutory rendition in the year 1354, uh, which says, uh, which uses those familiar words several times. No man of what is state, etc., shall be put out of land, nor taken, nor imprisoned, nor disinherited, nor put to death without being brought in answer by due process of the law. This was the situation in the United Kingdom. There was tremendous uh, judicial supremacy. As you are aware, common law is where uh, is uh, given to us by the United Kingdom. Later on, of course, the UK saw parliamentary supremacy taking over. Uh, Georgian England especially in the uh, in the 18th century onwards. So this kind of a wide scope for judges no longer exists in the UK. But that phrase made its way to uh, one of the original uh, colonies that gained independence from the United Kingdom, which is of course the United States. Not in the original constitution. Uh, this is just a look at the uh, Old English text of the Magna Carta. Coming back, not in the original constitution of the United States, but in the Bill of Rights. The fifth amendment, fifth out of ten, which formed the Bill of Rights, uses the phrase uh, due process of law. I'm looking at the image on the left, third row from the bottom, nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And later on, in the 14th amendment to the US Constitution, which appeared almost 80 years after the original constitution, Again, the third row from the bottom on the image on the right, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty or property without due process of law. 
the uh, 14th amendment obviously is targeted towards the individual states that uh, form the united states and if you re continue reading that 14th amendment you will see that it is corresponding to article 14 of the indian constitution nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws anyway coming back to our phrase due process of law this is where it comes to the fore in the united states in fact this uh, phrase caused a lot of problems in the united states in the first um, first decade or so of the 20th century where a substantive due process resulted in uh, the realization of those fears that i had uh, mentioned a few moments ago that the courts end up becoming some sort of a super legislature which is why interestingly in another constitution written by american authorities later in the day at the end of the second world war this phrase was not used when the opportunity arose i'm looking at article 31 of the constitution of japan 1946 uh, came into force in november 1946 uh, originally drafted by two american military officers who also were lawyers this was when the united states was occupying japan at the end of the second world war under uh, general douglas macarthur's uh, under his rule basically let's call it for want of a better phrase and we will see article 31 says that no person shall be deprived of life or liberty nor shall any other criminal penalty be imposed except according to procedure established by law no longer are the united states recommending the use of due process of law they are themselves when drafting other constitutions using the phrase procedure established by law around this same time um, the constituent assembly of india sat in its sessions 1946 to 1949 and the original draft that they came up with used the phrase due process almost concurrently with what was happening in japan but the constitutional consultant to the draft committee of the constituent assembly of india sir b n rao uh, was the one who recommended that change in our constitution sir b n rao a civil servant and uh, involved in the drafting of the constitution of burma at that time visited several democracies met with a lot of people involved in these things in these matters like jurists and judges he in one such encounter uh, was advised by mr felix Frank frankfurter associate justice of the united supreme united states supreme court at that time to move away from the due process uh, jurisprudence justice frankfurter recommended that india should follow the uh, procedure established by law jurisprudence just as japan had it's not surprising that such advice came from justice frankfurter who is a known advocate of judicial restraint it is this judicial restraint that we will note uh, was followed by the indian supreme court in the ak gopalan case but before that of course uh, the constituent assembly removed due process and instead drafted article 21 in this manner this is of course how the article appears to this day no person shall be deprived of his life or personal liberty except according to procedure established by law article 21 of the constitution of india so that kind of completes the basic groundwork that i wanted to do before heading on to the ak gopalan case and hope you will join me when we delve deeper into that thanks